This podcast is a Tofop production. Head to tofop.com for more. The following episode of Tofop is rated MA for mature audiences. It may contain sexual references, time travel references, allegations of bin misconduct, and mild coarse language. Tofop advises that this episode is not suitable for anyone under the age of 15 or anyone who thinks a comedy conversation between two old mates sounds like a terrible idea for a show. Minors must be accompanied by a parent or guardian. This is John Deke speaking. Everyone relax, this is Tofop, I'm Charlie Clawson. And I am Will Anderson, hello, and thank you for watching. Uh, I'm not very relaxed, Will. No, Charlie, <laughs> you are not very relaxed. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, it has not been a very mm. relaxing... Since the last time we spoke, a lot's happened. Mm. Uh, a, a lot has happened. Yeah, uh, okay, yes. well, where, where do you want to start? Okay, oh, uh, you know what? I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll give a little like preamble from my point of view, which is that we're going to talk about the area in which we both live. But mm. about a week and a half ago, I came to the Adelaide Fringe. And it, look, it's been a very wet summer where we live. It's been pretty much raining consistently for three months. And so there was forecast to be rain for when I went away. But there was no real warning that there was going to be what has been described by some people as a once in a thousand year flood happening. So about... Three days after I arrived in Adelaide, suddenly I realised that there was going to be a massive natural disaster where we all live and mm. that I needed to get back. And this is how bad it was for international listeners. I could not get back because the airports were closed, all the roads were closed. There was no way to even access my house if I had made it back. Everything was cut off. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sure we will get into all of this, but the entire town of Lismore was underwater. If you've not seen these photos, they are some of the most terrifying and horrific things that you will ever see. To to see, you know, two stories of water basically destroy an entire town. So, I come back tomorrow when we're recording this. Uh, I am going to have a suitcase full of puppy pads and dog food because oh, yeah, there is right. no way to access those things up there yeah. at the moment. So that's what uh, I have been required to bring back with me is puppy pads and uh, dog food. Yeah, I think uh, it, it kind of caught everyone on the hop. I mean, we had a very wet um, end to summer last year, you know, it sort of rained for four weeks consistently. Uh, but this seemed to be four weeks of rain in two days. Mm. I even said to Jem on the Sunday night when it sort of started, I was like, well, because last year we had a bit of seepage coming up, groundwater coming up into our downstairs living area. And I was like, well, I'll just, you know, I'll get ahead of the game. <laughs> I'll, I'll put out the sump pump, which is like an automated pump you put in your stormwater drain. When it gets to a certain level, it automatically pumps it out. And I put on my rain jacket because it's already starting to come down. And I was only out there for maybe like less than two minutes and I was soaked and it actually you know uh, that film Bowfinger with Eddie Murphy they talk about chubby rain chubby rain that's what that's <laughs> what the northern regions of New South Wales has been suffering from they've had a dose of chubby rain but it was it obese rain it wasn't just chubby like I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. fat shame this rain it was it was huge fat rain yeah I mean I know Millie Vanilli said don't blame it on the rain but it's fair to blame the rain for what happened up there and the other thing that I will blame is the lack of warning there was no warning that this was coming well no real strong warning that this was coming and that is you know, in this day and age where we really feel like we've got a handle on weather forecasting, at least with big storms, you, the fact that this one has just somehow slipped through the net while nobody was looking is almost as terrifying as the fact that it happened. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't recall anyone. And when you live in a rural area, the weather is a frequent topic of discussion and generally like, you know, we're part of all the kind of different forums and stuff that people will give you a heads up. And those guys you know, and girls are, are all over it. Like they'll let you know what the surf's doing. They'll let you know what the weather's doing. They'll let you know when you need to bring your things in, put your things out. Like, but no one saw it coming and it happened so quick. And I was a bit, I'll be honest, like the first 24 hours, we were a bit ignorant because we were like, okay, you know, daycare has been canceled. It's raining cats and dogs, mm. chubby, chubby rain. We're just going to buckle down, um, you know, and, and stay with Iona. And I was getting like texts from people saying, are you okay? Are you okay? And I was a bit like, what's going on? And then our mate VK sent me a photo two streets from my house 
and it was underwater, like, you know, six foot of water. And I, because it's right near a creek and I was like, oh my God. So it eased off luckily. And I'll just sort of, I'll preface this by saying my town is absolutely fine. We're in an elevated uh, position. It was one street that was badly hit. I went down the next day. Most people that I spoke to were doing all right. It didn't really get into the house. Um, but then you started to sort of see when you did see the pictures, what had happened in Lismore and Maynard and up north. And I, for the life of me, I've been saying this to people for the last three days. It's like, was it the fact that all the internet went down and the phones went down that no one was aware that people weren't talking about it? Because, you know, the last three days I've been volunteering and the stuff I've seen is like something out of a, a horror movie. You know, I was in Lismore yesterday and as you drive into town and you're looking at the trees, you can see where the water was and it's like 12 metres up these trees. They're just brown, covered in mud. You get the green at the top. And then once you actually hit town, it's just like piles and piles of debris and mud over everything. And it is the fact that it's not kind of like on the front page and, you know, part of the you know emergency national response. And we don't have Scott Morrison coming out and saying something while we don't have politicians reassuring us every hour about what help is coming. Like the last thing I saw up north sort of around Maynard and stuff is that backpackers and volunteers – are meeting there every morning to load up with chainsaws and water and diapers and stuff and hike into these because the roads up there, there's been landslides. Like, you can't drive up there. So we're getting fucking backpackers, people who normally walk behind the bar at the top pub in Byron Bay are doing the rescue mission. Now, don't get me wrong. It's amazing what the volunteers are doing and uh, that's incredible. But but shouldn't this be like a professional, organised, national response? Like, that's the thing that uh, everyone around here is, is asking. It's like, we haven't seen... Hey, come on, Charlie. Peter Dutton started a GoFundMe. Don't you know? Oh, yeah. I so, saw that. <laughs> Peter Dutton, who obviously has no other way that he could possibly, as a member of the government, high-ranking member of the government, help out people who are in the need in the middle of a disaster. Peter Dutton, a hero, Charlie, started a GoFundMe. So... I mean, I, I guess we're lucky that, like, Peter Dutton didn't see the boats going through Lismore and try to stop them, so. Well, I felt like, I feel like maybe if we had a rowing club mm. or something like that that needed, you know, like a grandstand oh, yeah. upgrade. If, and we if were we told the Liberal government that... they could turn all of Lismore into a car park, <laughs> <laughs> if they could make it a yeah. car park, or well, that'd be fine. <laughs> Fucking hell. Yeah, no, I believe, because being here in Adelaide while it's happening obviously I'm following it really closely because it's home like our place was cut off for a week you know all the roads were closed mudslides trees down and of course because of all the emergency workers were concentrating on the fact that you know Lismore absolutely needed people's attention and then like Mullumbimby there was like you know bull sharks in Mullumbimby it's 20 you know, it's 20 minutes from the yeah. beach and there's bull sharks in town like and then you have those other, you know, like places that were all cut off because there's trees down or there's mudslides. Of course, the emergency workers yeah. can't get out there when they're concentrating on even bigger disasters happening at the same time. But I will tell you, it's not front page of the papers. Like people aren't really even talking about it that much down here. Like it does feel like yeah. it's been an entire community just completely abandoned, that there is absolutely not enough attention, that this is a community that two years ago went through fires like that part of the world was like dealing with bushfires now they've had covid for two years and now they've just gone straight into floods and the government has just gone well good luck with that like yeah. <laughs> like glenn ridge to a contestant whose story he didn't enjoy on sale of the century the australian government has looked at the northern rivers and gone well good luck with that yeah it's it on one hand like you sort of look at this sort of community spirit and, you know, like there are businesses in my town that have literally shut down in order to transform themselves into um, f supplying food for emergency services, offering housing and stuff. Like people are like putting their entire lives on hold. And I'm like, I, I, I could have sworn, because I've put some stuff on social media and I've had a lot of people like attacking me about like, well, it's your fault for choosing to live there and blah, 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 you know, your life choices. It's like, holy fucking shit. Like, first of all, isn't a portion of my taxes put aside for natural disasters? Isn't that what, like, the kind of, like, national resilience, blah, 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 is set up for anyway? This $4 million pool of money that has been taken from all of us for all these years? And secondly, no one kind of 
uh, made the choice to have everything fucking taken away from them. Most of the people you speak to in Lismore are very aware of the risks of flood, but this was an unprecedented event. Like you said, like a once in a thousand year storm. Yeah, it won't be once in the next thousand years. It'll be about 500 times in the next yeah. thousand years. <laughs> so we should do something about that. But um, yeah, but also like people got to live places. And whether it be yeah. floods in Lismore or whether it be like, like I mean, there was an earthquake in Adelaide overnight. Like, you know, it, there, people live in different places yeah. that are going to face dangers. There's been bushfires in Western Australia at the moment. So, like, we can't, like, and the entire planet is going to get more and more filled with these natural disasters happening everywhere. So where the fuck are we all exactly meant to live that we're going to invo- avoid these things? Well, here's the thing, Will. Like, Byron Bay used to have lots of affordable accommodation and then it became this blue chip suburb and suddenly it becomes like there's people with five investment properties and so people can't afford to live there anymore and they get pushed out to Lismore and then Lismore gets flooded and the government's like, well, fuck you. Yeah. Are we going to change, like, uh, like, are we going to change the rules around investment properties? I mean, it's just, it's, it's fucking, it's just, it's, it's insane. It, and it really is... Everyone you speak to feels abandoned here. Like even the people who are kind of like, you know, uh, leading these kind of volunteer groups and like I've gone to all these different community centres and social centres and everyone's like, we haven't heard from anyone. <laughs> like there's no. no one. I mean, I would say this to the I would say this to the people of the Northern Rivers. This is the time where the decisions to you know tear down the five G towers really come back to haunt you. Like this is yeah. the one time <laughs> that I would really make a bold argument for the fact that you need some five G in the area. Yeah, uh, I mean that that is the, the, all the complaints I've made about my fixed wireless. Like I'm the one house in my town <laughs> that's actually had internet, and that's the other thing too that you kind of um, realize is just how fraught you know, those supply chains are and things like access because all of a sudden there was no petrol and no tankers could get in to refill. So everyone starts like panicking and trying to fill their cars up because as you know, out here, everything's 15 minutes drive away. You're not walking anywhere or getting public transport. Then all the supermarkets are empty, all the butchers are empty, all the greengrocers are empty because they can't get their deliveries from Brisbane and, you know, south. So it was, it was kind of hairy for a moment where I was like, luckily I'd done a big shop on the weekend and I was sort of like in my head going, okay, so I will, this is, we'll start the, you know, the first few days, we'll just sort of like hope for the best. But if it gets to Wednesday and nothing's opening up, that's when I'm going to start rationing. <laughs> like that, that's within three days. And it's a scary kind of prospect when you actually have to start thinking about, all right, well, I've got a two-year-old, so, um, you know, she needs these essential items to consume. So therefore I won't have coffee in the morning because she's going to need milk you know and then it's like well she also needs iron and vitamins <laughs> so like i can get by living on like toast and fucking barbecue shapes but you know she needs nutrition and then the nappies is like the massive thing because that's not something that you can get just anywhere you have to go to, to big supply places and that the other thing i'd say too is all the people who work in retail like who work in the supermarkets and the petrol stations and stuff fucking God bless you. Like through COVID and now this, the shit that they have been putting up with, the shit that I have witnessed. I saw one guy at the uh, Tiagra Shell um, being called a fascist because he couldn't give this woman a uh, petrol for free. But that is the definition of fascism. That, that if you look it up, if somebody doesn't give you petrol for free, they are a fascist. <laughs> <laughs> But this guy was like, he was very accommodating too. He's like, I completely understand, you know, like, yeah, I would love it if, you know, my boss called me up and said, hey, let everyone fill up for free. But, you know, I, this is, I, I can't, get 15 I can't bucks make an that hour. decision. You know, that is like, above my pay grade. If I just yeah, come in and go, you know yeah, what, like, boss, I just decided to give away all your petrol for free today. <laughs> And then yesterday I was at my local supermarket, which thankfully had been, you know, partially restocked. At least they had like vegetables and stuff. So I went and got a few things, huge lines, every, you know, um, check out huge lines. And um, there's signs everywhere saying no FPOS, no FPOS. Yeah. It's gone back to a cash based system. The, the entire, uh, I'm assuming bartering the entire is system next. went down. The entire system went down. Yeah. In fact, I know people who like, you know, there were local businesses who were just saying to people, come and pay it back when you can come and pay it back just because there was no FPOS yeah. system. There was no, and not everybody had access to cash, you know? No, I mean, that's the thing about no warning. If there's a warning, people can move yeah. their valuables away. If there's a warning that people can have things like a whole bunch of cash and fuel and stuff on hand. But if there's no warning, then 
suddenly all these resources aren't there for yeah. people as well. I don't even know if the warnings, like for the guy I spoke to yesterday, the house I was cleaning out yesterday, his house is 12 metres up. His floorboards are 12 metres up. And he was saying like that, you know, by the time when he got the warning, he had enough time, he started packing his, like he had his go kit because, you know, people in Liz Lismore are used to floods. And so he put that together and in the time that, because he looked at his front door, it was at his bottom step. And by the time he got his shit together, it was then at his front door and he had no way of getting out. And then he showed me in his living room. So floorboards are 12 metres up. Then he showed me where the water got to in his living room. There's another two and a bit metres above that. So almost 15, me 15 metres high. Like it is like fucking Godzilla is walking through the town just kicking shit over. So then he tells me that... Um, so he's on his front step. It's fucking pissing down, howling rain, like scary, scary conditions. And he lives on his own. And so he's on his front step and he just starts yelling out, help me, because what the fuck else is he going to do? One of his neighbours, 50 metres directly across from him, hears him. This guy's a fucking hero. Grabs a paddleboard, jumps out in his paddleboard, swims against the flow of the tide to get to this fucking dude, gets him and his bag onto his paddleboard, then goes all the way back. This guy gets to his neighbor's place. He's got fucking eight family members already huddled in the house. They've got no fucking idea what they're going to do. They realize if they can get up the road about 100 meters, the water's lower near the primary school. I'm going to get emotional talking about this, but the dad has to make the decision about, you know, which family members he's going to transport. So he gets his fucking four-year-old and his 18-month-old baby at the front of this paddleboard and paddles them up the street and drops them off and then comes back and gets his next kids. And just the thought of what that must be fucking like. You know, the fear that must have been going through those kids in the family. By the time the dad came back for the fourth time, he was fucking exhausted. The guy I was speaking to said, you know, he got on the paddleboard and he was like, mate, like, I just can't ask you to do it for me. Just fucking, like, take yourself. I don't want you. I mean, why are people being forced to make those decisions, you know? Like, it just, it just, it, it just blew my mind. And thankfully, someone came by in a fucking dinghy and got both of them and they got, both got to safety. But it's like, that's one, that's one story of what's happened in one fucking town. And it's just, it's just crazy. I just feel like this, this should be like yeah. everywhere. So people should be we knowing both these know stories. people who've lost everything. Like, you know, people who literally lost every single thing that's in their house. You know, like friends of ours who are artists who had, you know, a house full of, you know, art they'd you know, made over years that is all now just irreplaceable, irreplaceable, you know, completely destroyed, you know, gone from their lives, you know, all these sort of things. And... Like we actually, funnily enough, had some – like it's such a – you know, like we – I mean, we don't know this for sure, but I'm sure it is probably the case. We had some art getting framed in Lismore and uh, um, we had a, a, a video that we were getting converted from an old disc into a – like – and, you know, just shit like that. And you think, oh, that's annoying for us and it's such a small thing for us. Yeah. It, imagine what that's like when that's not, hey, just a few precious things that, you know, you really regret not having anymore, but it's – every precious thing that you, you like i mean literally everything yeah. that you had in your house that you love that you look at every day that reminds you of different times every like all of it's fucking gone all of it's been washed all washed away it. all of it mate we were in this guy's house and we would just we just opened the doors and windows and we threw yeah. it all out like i mean we did keep some clothes i've got a couple loads of washing here i'm doing for him like dishes and stuff like that but i mean he's a he's this guy works with wood you know he makes guitars like all that shit gone all these fucking tools expensive tools gone or you know ruined and i mean even talking to the guy like because there's they give you advice you know when you get there like you know people are in shock and you know you don't i he was volunteering information i wasn't kind of like you know yeah. i didn't tell me everything what did you lose grill is most yeah. precious i've got a <laughs> yeah. podcast and i need to talk yeah. about it yeah, I did good, good cop, bad cop. I just painted half my face like good cop, bad cop. Um, no, but he was – he. I, I could sort of see like, you know, we. there was a couple other people there who were, I don't know, uh, I didn't really learn the hierarchy. You just turn up places and just people give you a job and you just get going. I'm assuming these guys work in social services or, or, or something because they had more of an idea of – they seemed to be leading what was going on. And um, one of the bits of advice they give is like don't ask people – oh, do you want to keep this or do you want to throw it out? Like, just use your judgment. People are in shock. They can't make those decisions. Just, like, use your judgment. You know, if it's kind of a perishable, like a book or something made of wood, it's 
gone, like just get rid of it. But, you know, if it's something that can be saved or clothes that can be washed that aren't too good. Um, and so I, I was cleaning, I, you know, it, I, I, was, I moved some stuff aside and found this like globe of the world, you know, like you'd see in a classroom, just like this, this globe of the world. And it was waterlogged. It was filled. It's really heavy. And uh, I just, for, for whatever reason, I was like, I should ask him about this. I don't know why, you know, like I, I, I was about to toss it and I'm like, I should ask him about it. And I'm so fucking glad I did. Because when I went down and said, hey, man, I found this, like, would you like me to hang on to it for you? There was a whole story behind it. You know, it was a gift from his father. It had gold inlay, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, like you're saying, there's people who've lost all that stuff, you know, and it's not stuff that you can claim on insurance. It's not stuff that you can buy another set off. You know, there's there's a story behind it, which is just erased and, from and existence. It's, it's not even being acknowledged now. Like, I mean, often with these communities, the thing that I worry about the most is that, you know, normally you get the initial, you know, concern and, and then that yeah. goes away and it actually takes years to rebuild. Whereas... There's not even that much interest in it now. Like, <laughs> Great. <laughs> what's it going to be like in, you know, six weeks from now or six months from now or two years from now as these people are trying to rebuild their lives still and they're not getting any support? Yeah. I, I am, uh, have been contacted by Mandy Nolan, who people in that region will know Mandy Nolan. She's a community leader and a comedian. And uh, Mandy's trying to organise a, a comedy gig where we can get like some comedians who are you know, from up there or have connections from up there to do a big fundraiser. And we'll try to do that as, as soon as we possibly can. But I'm sure over the next few months, there will be a bunch of opportunities to do fundraising stuff at the moment. Like, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, putting on a show, it's too soggy to put on a show anywhere at the moment, but obviously people need assistance straight away, but they'll also need assistance going forward so and i think that's important well when you do the the comedy show can we invite someone from the government and charge them 4.5 billion dollars for right. their ticket is that yeah possible? we're gonna sell one ticket 4.5 billion dollars yeah. it's an nft <laughs> we'll call it an nft <laughs> we'll charge the government 4.5 billion dollars <laughs> I mean, the thing about uh, f uh, the floods too is like, you know, I've never had any experience. I've never really lived in a flood area and had any experience being around it. And I've had a little bit of experience with bushfires. And the, the kind of one thing that's really striking is like when there's a bushfire, uh, you know, things sort of like are like get destroyed and, 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 and gone. But with the flood, it's almost like there's two disasters. There's the flood and then there is the expansive debris which is all soaked and expanded and waterlogged like there's no things haven't just disappeared and you can just clear it through like there are if you drive through any of these towns there are mountains and mountains like entire households just tipped out on the front and i have no idea what they're going to do with it like how they're going to move it where it's going like, to go what what amount of time it's going to take to move it and also like without wanting to be too grotesque about it like there's going to be dead animals and stuff all over the place as well and those those animals yeah. need to be moved because obviously, and you're talking about disease and like without wanting to make too much of a point of it, a community that already there's a lot of people who aren't vaccinated and stuff. You, you hope that there's not going to be, you know, in two weeks from now, COVID rip through the community as well because people have been huddled together or helping each other and not in positions where they can socially distance or wear masks or those things are all impractical in the middle of a natural disaster. So like, you know, the point being the ongoing effects, like, you know, of yeah. any diseases just because there's been mud everywhere and people can't get clean drinking water and these sort of things is like, it's not just the water, getting the water out of the carpet even, right? It's all the ongoing mm. things that are going to be ram yeah, ramifications in the community for weeks and months to come. Yeah. And look, I don't want to, to bum everyone out. Oh, no, you this, have already. So no, no, no. With... You've absolutely <laughs> fucking bummed everybody else already. Let's see if we can make something comedic out of this. Here's, here's what my take on it is. Um, this is what I've been doing on stage here in uh, Adelaide to talk about it. And I said, you know, things are fucked up. I said, I grew up on a dairy farm and you know, things are fucked up when you see a cow on a roof. That's that's the one thing my dad told me to look out for. If any of the cows aren't in the yeah. paddock and they're up on the roof, 
that some shit has gone down and there was a cow on the roof in this war. So to me, that is a sign that things got fucked up. Uh, my neighbour um, lives across the fence. She's a lovely old lady um, and she's been so uh, sweet and great during this whole thing. She was like doing a little bake. Uh, she was making food for the SES crews and stuff. She came around and borrowed a whole bunch of Tupperware because she was doing a big lamb roast for She wanted to take all this food out to the volunteers. Um, so we've been sort of communicating and all, all this kind of stuff. And I came back from yesterday's cleanup and I was like, you know, head to toe, just like covered in just shit and mud and, and just gross. And I had all this stuff that I'd taken from this guy's house that I was going to wash for him. And so she popped over, um, just to see how I went and if she could help. And I said, well, you know, it would be amazing. I've got all these pots and pans from his kitchen. If you could just give these a scrub and, you know, maybe a bit of a bleach and I'll take them back to him in a couple of days. She's like, oh, absolutely, no, no, no problem. So she left to go do it. And I was thinking, like, I'm not planning on going back to this guy's house, you know, for a couple of days. So take your time. It's fine. I like, don't need it back straight away. So, you know, Gem's with Iona in the kitchen and our laundry is in our back deck. So for people who haven't, uh, so you can understand. So my back deck faces onto the back fence, which separates from the, the neighbor's property. So she walks around the fence. And when she walks around the fence, she can see straight into the back deck. Now, on the back deck is also my laundry. And I didn't want to take my dirty, stinky clothes into the house. So I was like, well, I'll just strip off in the laundry and I'll grab a towel from the laundry and I'll walk back across the deck into mm-hmm. the house. <laughs> so you can see I can. Going, well, I'd right? be surprised if it isn't so going I where I think it's going. So I sent her over the pots and pans. It's <laughs> <laughs> thinking that she was, you know, going to drop it back in the next, like, couple of days. So I strip off naked, I walk out of the laundry naked with a towel over my shoulder, and there is my elderly neighbour on the back deck holding a tray full of pristines, pots and pans. Mate, I just, it was, I felt so bad. Like, I, I mean, she kind of wandered onto my property, but somehow I felt like I had assaulted her somehow. Well, you've lured her in with pots and pans, like, you know... <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> it's some sort of honey trap for I an old person. I did kind of. You know, like, return these whenever you want. But you know what? I'm a dirty guy <laughs> and I might just be naked. <laughs> I did kind of say to her, kind of, it was a, a semi-aggressive but semi-joking when she came back. I was like, I thought you were going to be a couple of days <laughs> when I saw her there because I was so embarrassed. And she, she played yeah, it brilliant. What, yeah, what was her reaction? Oh, no reaction. As if maybe like her eyesight was failing. Like she just, there was no, she did not register it. She did acknowledge it. She just said, she just explained that I gave them a good scrub. I put like a teaspoon of bleach, blah, blah, blah. They're ready to go. If there's anything more you want to bring over, you know, just let me know. And I was like, okay, great. No problem. And she didn't acknowledge it in the slightest. So yeah. part of me is thinking maybe she does have bad eyesight and she didn't see it. But other part of me is like, this old lady's cool as shit, man. Like, she's not flustered. I mean, chances are she has bad eyesight. Most old people have bad eyesight, right? Um, he says yeah. as he does this podcast Mate. with glasses on because I can't stare at my computer <laughs> screen without glasses anymore because I have bad eyesight. Um, I think she hasn't seen it. I think she's like... I think she wanted to. I think next time she's going to come around with one of those giant magnifying glasses that old people use. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, lady, you don't need a magnifying glass. She All goes, right? well, I need to get up closer then. It's a little cold. <laughs> it's very, but it's very humid. Everything's hanging. Don't worry about it. It's like warm Play-Doh at the moment. <laughs> Everything's bloody warm and sticky. It's disgusting. Uh, now, Will, I have an article. Uh, this is an old, uh, uh, an old uh, Tofop trope, someone that we love talking about. Actually, listener Chloe, uh, I was just going through the mailbag, and she sent in a link. She's something we thought we could talk about. But I clicked on it, and it was one of those annoying, like, one of those, you know, those clickbait things you see at the yes. bottom of articles? It's like, 12 child stars. You won't believe what they look like. So it was called um, Actors Who Were Forced to Play Roles Against mm-hmm. Their Will. And I clicked on it, and... A lot of it's annoying, but I found this one article about one Keanu Reeves. Okay. And I was like, well, that's interesting. So instead of going through this kind of clickbait thing, I found another article from The Guardian, and it turns out that Keanu Reeves was forced to do a film against his will. So uh, this is more than 20 years ago. The headline is Keanu, colon, I was tricked into making a film. Oh, brilliant. Thoughts so far? Well, I mean... 20 years ago, I'm trying to like work out what's going on in the world that Keanu could be tricked into making a film. Like he's already, he's like, I mean, when's, when did the first Matrix movie come out? How long ago 90, did that come out? 99. 
So he was tri- the year so- after The Matrix. So one of the biggest movie stars in the world with a team of – Managers, managers, and agents. I imagine. Yet he was tricked into making a film. Yeah, but he's just come off the Matrix, and that would have fucked with his head, man. He wouldn't have known what was real and what was like the Matrix, and so like he's probably like he's like you know his managers on the phone going, "This is not a real movie." And he's like, <laughs> then he's like, "That's bullshit, man." Like I, I'm in the Matrix. Like you know, I, I think that's probably what's happened. Did you watch Resurrections? Uh, I have not watched it yet. We we oh. got about um, ten minutes in, and uh, Amy was like, "I don't want to watch this anymore," and so I have to find a time where I can watch it by myself. It uh, look, you know, it's worth watching just as a curiosity piece, but it is mm. terrible. Like it is, it's kind of like if Ryan Johnson was like, you know what, I'm going to fuck with it, people's expectations for Star Wars, and that really angered Star Wars nerds. This is this times a hundred you might actually love it because it, yeah. it, it, it that's is right up a, my alley those yeah. sort of things <laughs> it's it's it's, it's there's, there's a bit of an anarchist fuck you spirit to all this it's kind of yeah. like oh you think that this is what the matrix is and you think that this is what you love about the matrix i'm gonna just fucking tear yeah. down yeah. all those expectations tear down all those things that you love about the matrix and just expose it for what it actually is so you might actually like it i mean it sounds pretty good the way you describe <laughs> it <laughs> But it's not. It's really like some. I read I saw a review where someone said they've kind of made it critic proof because yeah. they're sort of like the meta nature of it is like fucking sequels suck and reboots suck and bringing the cast back after 20 years sucks. And so because they're acknowledging it in the film, it's like, well, can you critique the film? Because they're actually acknowledging in the film that these things suck and that they never work and mm. fan services for fucking losers. Well, I've noticed that people still have critiqued the film, so that yeah. did not work if that was the plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Keanu, I was tricked into making a film. Uh-huh. Keanu Reeves has claimed, so it already starts off that the reporter, I don't mm-hmm. think, buys mm-hmm. Keanu's story, has claimed that he was press ganged into starring in the serial killer thriller The Watcher after a friend forged his signature on the contract. Now, first question, what does press ganged mean? I mean, I know the show Press Gang with Spike, but what's, uh, what's press ganged to be, to be press ganged? Um, maybe Podcast it's work? like Did when a gang Google of pre- press ganged. Maybe when it's when like a gang of people press you, like that would make me do something. Press ganged. If I uh, if like there was just like eight people say in a circle all just kind of pressing me. It sounds I, hot. I wouldn't. I would, oh, really? <laughs> like, sounds yeah. gross. I know. I I'm, like I'm in a bit of crushing. I like a bit, <laughs> like a bit of crushing. Um, that's my weird quirk. Okay, from Mike, he says mm. a body of men in wank. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe a body of men employed to enlist men forcibly into service in the army or navy. So okay. it's just like pressure, yeah. peer pressure, press gang. Yeah, okay. a press gang. Yeah, they came around and they're like, time for you to be in the navy, son. Okay. Uh, unable to conclusively prove the forgery, Reeves says that he finally agreed to take the role rather than face mm. a protracted legal battle. So hang on, he says his friend? His mate forged his signature on the contract to make the film and he couldn't prove that it wasn't his signature. To me, it sounds like Keanu was drunk or high or something and signed it and then regretted it. No, I, I, I believe Keanu. I like this story. I believe this story. <laughs> and I, I love the idea that this whole thing could come down to a signature and whether people prove you can forge it or not, because now every single document online is just like, hey, this is an important legal document. By the way, sign it online. Whatever signature you care. can find on the internet, squiggle <laughs> yeah. on your fucking page. Like, yeah. like every contract I sign has a different fucking signature on it. Like I'm Leonardo DiCaprio trying to have different identities these days. But back in these days, you could get Keanu Reeves to make a film just because his signature was on the contract. But surely those contracts aren't worth the paper they're written on. Don't contracts get voided and ripped up constantly? Like people don't have to see something through. No, uh, but uh, but there can be legal consequences for your legal breaking a contract. Yeah. Okay. So the film The Watcher was directed by Joe Charbanek, an erstwhile buddy of Keanu, who also oh. filmed the actor on tour with his rock band Dogstar. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. I remember Dogstar. Yeah, okay. That's Keanu's version of Toe Fog. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if there's like two guys with a podcast in uh, called Pogstar or <laughs> Podstar. <laughs> 
Uh, the movie starred the Matrix hero as a menacing killer who taunts James Spader's overwrought cop. Have you seen The Watcher? Are you uh, familiar mm. with it? Oh, no, I have no uh, idea. I can't, I can't remember it. I think I can remember the poster, which is like a silhouette of Keanu's face, like with his hands out as if he's going to throttle someone. At the time of filming, there were reports that Reeves was unhappy that what he had envisaged as a minor role had been made the centre of the film. He was well, also rude. Yeah, that, with- that, that makes a lot of sense. This, this right. part of the story, it's like, you know, he's agreed to do this film, like for a mate of his who filmed his band back in the day. And then he's gone and made The Matrix and he's the biggest star in the world. And old mate's gone, you know, this cameo, it'd be great if Keanu was the star of this film. (laughs) He was also rumoured to have been outraged to discover that he was receiving a reported $1.5 million less than his co-star James Spader. Even in 1999, was James Spader really a bigger star? Has James Spader ever Maybe prior to like 1990, prior to Bill and Ted, James Spader would have been a bigger star. But I would have thought Keanu's always been a bigger star. Yeah, than James Keanu's Spader. problem was Keanu's problem was that uh, James Spader was getting 1.6 million dollars. <laughs> so I think that was the problem. Now it transpires that Ree's annoyance ran deeper still. This is a quote from Keanu: "I never found the script interesting, but a friend of mine forged my signature on the agreement." He told a Calgary Sun newspaper, "I couldn't prove he did it." And I didn't want to get sued. So I had no other choice but to do the film. Um, Reeves said that when his lawyer showed him the contract, he went, whoa. No, (laughs) I'm making that up. (laughs) Reeves says that other legal stipulations meant that he had to wait 12 (laughs) months after the film's release before being able to go public with his anger. If it's September, that means it's been a year so I can finally talk, he told the newspaper. Okay, so... I don't under uh, this to me all sounds very very suspicious. Like what kind of NDA would he have signed that would expire after one year? So you can't talk about the film until twelve months after the fact. It just seems weird. Yeah, you, you well you could have a, a limit on the the time. Yeah, I think that 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 would be fine. I can imagine that you could have a limited non disclosure term in regard to, you know, not being able to badmouth the film within twelve months of it being released, but after that you can do whatever you want to do. That- it's just it's just interesting though, like that this guy, his mate, who's sounds like a first time director, yeah. Going up against the biggest movie star in the world at that time, who would probably have the backing of his enormous agency and his enormous management group and deep pockets, that they would be scared to go into battle, like who did this guy have in his corner? Unless the studio that was backing the film had deeper pockets, like it was, you know, maybe like backed by a Russian oligarch or something like that, where they're like, oh yeah, man, we will see you into oblivion. Or on advice of his lawyers, they're like, you'll be tied up with this for years. You won't be oh, ma- You know, I mean, maybe he didn't want the bad press of like, you know, suddenly being caught up in legal action with like a dude who – used to tour around with him with his band or something. Maybe, like, it was a, a bit more... Oh, he wanted to be fr- so keep the friendship? Is that what you mean? Well, I just mean, like, you know, it's not a great look to be involved in a protracted legal battle around, you know, maybe, you know, he's just come off the Matrix. It's nothing but good press. He's just like, ah, oh, fuck it, I don't want to get inv- the lawyers involved. Okay. All right, let's, let's, let's hypothetical this. So let's mm. just say that I write a film and I say, hey, Will... Um, I'm making this film. I've written this great little cameo. You come in, just do a few jokes, do what you do. Boom, bang, you're out. And you sign it. You, I just send you the scene that you're in. Or yeah. I tell you, this is the scene you're doing. And you like it. You're like, oh, yeah, it's pretty funny. I think I can do something with that. And so you sign the contract. Then I send you the full script. And you're like, fuck, hang on. I'm in every single page. Like, I'm actually the star of this film. What happens next? And you don't like the rest of the script. You like that one scene, but you don't like... The rest of the script. And I've got your signature. I've got you. Yeah, well, but I didn't sign it. You forged it. So I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, mate, you signed no, it. I sent you the PDF signature. and you and you clicked on a button no, and I've got your signature. I'm not sure signature. that you can prove that is the case. So I will uh, yes, be suing no. you. I will be suing you. you that- I'm going to sue you. <laughs> I'm going to counter sue. Oh, wow. Mm, <laughs> Isn't this shit no. real quick? <laughs> I can see why Keanu didn't want to fucking, I'll just do the movie. I mean, he's still getting paid. Like the the downside for Keanu is 
he gets paid a million dollars and gets great catering for like four to five months and probably really good trailer and stuff like that and you know gets to hang out you know and yeah make play, some play make bass. some shit movie that no one's ever seen or enjoyed it's fine yeah, whatever he's made a ton of shit yeah. movies so I guess you're right yeah like, you know what you know, what Keanu's a if smart one, dude if there's one point five million dollars in it for me Charlie I'll make you shit movie I don't care how shit it is <laughs> I'm in you ain't getting you ain't getting a million. In fact, I'm going to get Adam Hills and pay him just slightly more than you, just to really rub it in. Uh, at the time of its release, Reeves refused to promote The Watcher. In the event, however, the film spent in the in the event, however, the film spent two weeks at the top of the U.S. box office. Mm-hmm. But Charbanek's picture met with largely negative reviews, and Reeves' villainous turn was pinpointed by many as a major flaw. And this is a reviewer's quote. Short of getting Angela Lansbury or Rodney Dangerfield or Lassie for the part, the miscasting could not be more complete, wrote The Guardian's Peter Bradshaw. Keanu is profoundly wrong as a serial killer. Mm. Well, well done, Pete. You bloody hit the nail right in the head. I mean, didn't want to fucking be there. did not want to be there. Ironically, probably wanted to murder his old mate who'd forged his signature. <laughs> but don't you think it's weird that... He could the, the, so the NDA says you can't badmouth the film for twelve months, but you don't have to promote it. So they're saying, all right, yeah. this is the compromise. You don't have to promote the film. We're not going to ask you to do any press junkets or anything, but you can't yeah. say shit for twelve months. What a horrible, toxic work environment. Like, I so said, just say you, Joe. What's the guy's name? Charbanic. Yeah. Just say you, Joe Charbanic. Joe Charbanic so it, goes right? up to Keanu Reeves and he says, Keanu. You say it best when you say nothing at all. So please <laughs> do not mention this movie. But what a weird thing to think that you're suddenly going to have like a, a harmonious set. So you've mm. tricked one of your mates into doing yep. a movie. You've had to slap him with an NDA. You've acknowledged that he's fucking hates it. And you've like had to say to him, don't bad mouth the film. And guess what? It's fine. When the film comes out, we'll make money in the first weekend so we don't give a fuck if you if you if you don't promote it so what's that next like two three months going to be like directors and actors work very closely together i imagine you've just created a rod with which you are going to what's the saying you're going to put a rod on your back and it hurts (laughs) yes that is the saying (laughs) i believe you really put a rod on his back and it hurt (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah, he made a rod for his own back, put it on his back, and yeah. it definitely hurt. Um, and it definitely hurt. Well, I mean, no, I think it's the opposite. It maybe teaches the wrong lesson. The fact that Keanu, like this dude's forged Keanu's signature, you know, in Keanu's yeah. words, and then, like, Keanu's actually done the movie. I bet this guy's gone on to, like, guarantee studios. He's gone, I've got a new method, guys. I can get you Brad Pitt. All i got to do. Forge his signature and he'll do the movie. It worked with Keanu. Who do you need? <laughs> Schwarzenegger. I can do that. Arnold Schwarzenegger. There you go. That would be amazing. This guy just yeah. has like a whole slate of movies that is lined up purely by just forging yeah. signatures. Just like yeah. his e- terrible director, fucking great at handwriting. Yeah. <laughs> really good. Who do you want to be in it? Tom Hanks? Absolutely. Nailed it. He's in it. Okay. Who else? Name another one. Got him. The Rock? Got him. Jennifer Lawrence, Tom Hanks. <laughs> Shit, there's like, do I sign Dwayne or do I sign The Rock? <laughs> How does he legally sign his name? <laughs> it's Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Uh, well, uh, let's dip into the mailbag. We have so much correspondence to get through. Months and months and months. Um, this comes from Megan, and this is all about Foz, the guy who does all our artwork. She says, a Fosdyke art book would be the singular greatest piece of merchandise you could ever sell. I heard he puts extra dicks in things. Could there be a page effect where adjusting the page in certain light makes the dicks pop? I love everything you do. I think that's a great idea. We have talked yeah, about it for a long talked time. About a it. Coffee table book of Fosdyke art. There are some ideas. I actually caught up with James on the weekend. We had breakfast together on Saturday, which was very lovely. And um, he is looking good, by the way, James Fosdyke. Is he? Yeah, looking very yeah. fit and looking very healthy and uh you know, very happy, like doing great work at the moment as well. So we, yeah, we had a few a chat about like, you know, some few things that hopefully he has ambitions for this year and in the next couple of years with the podcast. Quantum Cop obviously oh. is something that he is particularly excited about at the moment, you know. So, you know, um, and he's been drawing comic strips for everyone relax. So 
there's some cool stuff that he is doing at the moment. And if you want to find that cool stuff, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Tofop. Not only do you get Fosdark's great comic strips and artwork, but you can also get uh, bonus episodes of this show. You can get full videos of the shows. At the moment, it's going to be a bit weird because we're on Zoom. Yes. We are moving to a new platform soon. I'm upgrading our system. <laughs> Hopefully, well, I did order these uh, 5G dongles last week, but uh, I got a message from Telstra saying, hey, surprisingly, we can't get anything hey, to you. get fucked. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, This next bit of mail, Will, is from Michael, who says, Hey, Will and Charlie, I've been a listener now for a year, and after first hearing and enjoying Will on various dollop podcasts, I recently started episode one when I ran out of new episodes. In episode 11, Will states, do your own research. (laughs) So I put this current debacle on him. Yeah. Just kidding. Love this show. When I make it to Australia, I would love to show my support. Mike from Canada. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, well, ironically, I have a whole routine about how you shouldn't do your own research in this year's show. Well, Logical, <laughs> which is now on sale in uh, Melbourne, Sydney. I think Brisbane is going to be on sale very soon. So I just did um, 10 shows of it in Adelaide and actually had a really super time. Thank you to everybody in Adelaide who came out to see the show. And, um, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So, I've, yeah, I've added Sydney dates. I'm at the Enmore, um, which the floor of the Enmore collapsed this week. But uh, the floor will be fine by the time. I saw that. Fucking hell. Yeah. <laughs> like, as somebody uh, tweeted, and so, I wish I could know- attribute this, but uh, that floor has supported more Australian artists than the government has in the last 18 months. <laughs> so, I hope they get it. Uh, I hope that they get it fixed very soon. Can you, uh, do you know, have you exhausted all your Patreon allocation of tickets, the discount ones? Because if not, we should direct people there as well. I know there was limited numbers. I don't think that they are all sold out yet. So on the Willosophy and Tofop Patreon pages, if you go th- go there, there are links uh, for uh, discounted tickets for the Melbourne International Comedy Festival, 25% off uh, for 25% Patreon off, subscribers. Yeah. So if you are a Patreon subscriber and you want to buy tickets, uh, follow those links for cheaper tickets. Uh, this is from Carly. Hi, Will and Charlie. I like the podcast and hope you'll be back talking random crap soon. Um, are either of you watching the Peacemaker TV show? Uh, yes, I'm one episode off finishing it. I love it. Have you seen it, Will? I have not watched any television for a couple of weeks. Uh, I wasn't watching Peacemaker before that. I would like to watch it. I don't know it's if that would be an Amy it. thing, though. She would, I don't think she would like it, would she? Mm, you know what? I've been... I. Because Gemma and Amy have similar tastes and Gemma like swore off superhero shit a long time ago. And after like episode four, I'm like, I think I could get her back with this one. So it'll be interesting. It'll depend a lot on, because James Gunn's tone in this, it's very, it's very Tarantino-esque. Mm-hmm. Like it's very, it's very violent. It's very funny. It's kind of subversive. But it does have all those kind of comic booky elements. I I don't know, man. Like it's it's a really interesting, funny, weird show. I think it might be weird enough for Amy. So do your own research. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I reckon. I reckon once you get to like episode three or four, you'll have a good sense of whether or not she'll dig it. I could let me. I, yeah, I would say that if she watched it and hated it, I could understand it. But if she watched it and loved it, I could also okay. understand it. So let, how's that for non fucking committal answer, answer, answer for you? <laughs> Uh, this is from Sarah. This is a bit of a long one, so maybe we can okay. finish on this one. A, uh, 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 hey, Tofop. Here's a tantalizing Tofop tidbit. Anyway, thanks for the many hours of laugh and keeping me sane during my long days walking solo through the wild backcountry of Tasmania. Shout out to Tasmania. Surveying flora for work. You two provided me much needed relief for my dear boss. It's perhaps nicest to simply say she'd lived for, it, it, say she'd lived for a little too long on her own in a very remote part of Tasmania. The job was not what it was advertised to be. I was forced to live on site with my boss in a derelict caravan with no reception, no power, and a one kilometer walk to a bathroom and with a woman who enjoyed shooting feral cats <laughs> and then hanging them off the neighbor's gates and who was convinced that I was spying on her for Bob Brown. <laughs> On the basis that I had a green sticker on my car. Wolf Creek vibes were real. <laughs> Fucking hell. There's, all right, okay. let's, there's a lot to take in yes. there. So, all right, so she's living out in the bush uh, with her boss, yes. which sucks already, in a derelict caravan with no reception, no power, and a one-kilometer walk uh, from the toilet. 
with someone who likes shooting and displaying feral cats. So I'm going to ask you a question. How long would you last in this situation? If this was a situation that was presented to you, how long do you think you would stick it out for? A day, I reckon. Once, once it got to the hanging of the feral cats, yeah. that would be like... I think I could handle the annoying no reception, no power thing. Mm. You know, you got books and shit like that. And getting away from it to take a shit would mm. be like, I'd look forward to that. I would plan my days. I would eat so much Metamucil so I could be fucking in that toilet most parts of the day. But yeah, the kind of, um, I mean, I'm assuming she's sort of like fairly right-leaning if she's got a problem with Bob Brown as well. So I think the cat shooting and the fucking anti-left rants would probably b- burn me out after 24 hours. Okay, ask me the same question. How long do you reckon you'd last, Well. I would not get out of the car in the first place. I would pull up, I would see the situation, I would turn around and I would go home. There is no way that I would stay in. Like any one of the things that she has said about this situation would turn me off. It. The fact that there are eight of them and they're all combined together, are, I mean, this is already like my worst nightmare. It sounds like it's some kind of like TV show, doesn't it? Like... We took two contestants and put them in a dilapidated caravan with no power, no water, and a toilet one kilometre away. One of them's a lefty. One of them's a righty. One of them shoots cats. (laughs) One of them loves cats. (laughs) (laughs) I was uh, was quickly fed up and mildly anxiety-riddled. Yeah, mildly. I can't imagine why when you've got a gun-toting, murderous fucking... Imagine the dead uh, cats probably would have been that. (laughs) But the pay was good amidst mm. a global pandemic okay. and the house price is rising quicker than I could save for. Uh, uh, I decided to stick it out, questionably, my six-month contract and negotiated working alone most of the time. Okay. Each fortnight, I download a ton of podcasts, including Tofop, before heading to work to bush hell. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, look, I don't like, tell, like telling Foz what to name an episode, but Bush Hell, I think is fucking pretty good. I mean, I am living in Bush Hell right now, it seems like. Uh, I listened my way back through the episodes of Tofot. I listened my way through the back episodes of Tofot, walking around in the wilderness, avoiding snakes and trying to hide, uh, trying to find the tiniest of weeds and orchids. Then I worked my way through Fofop. Eventually, all of the pods were running low and I had no choice but to delve into the first 50 episodes of TOEFOP. On the odd occasion that my boss would be working nearby and catch me laughing out loud, no doubt it had been an issue with Charlie's, she started to accuse me of not listening to her instructions and of being distracted by my podcasts. I only ever worked with one headphone in and I could clearly see that she was miming to me, pretending to speak. (laughs) Oh my God. Because she was a bit nuts. That's fucking, it. she is crazy. <laughs> crazy. That reminds me, remember that fucking crazy neighbor I had in Sydney? Yeah. The one who complained about that. That was the type of shit she used to do. Like, pretend she's talking to see if you're like ignoring her. Yeah, this, like, that's fucking. This crazy. is like a Francis McDormand <laughs> movie or something, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, I could never explain TOEFOP to her, and instead I was listening to TED Talks. Mm. Yeah, fucking couldn't be further from the truth. One day driving off site, she and I, for whatever reason, swapped cars. I couldn't work out why the TOEFOP episode, which was playing, wasn't coming through my speakers. After following my boss down the road for around 10 minutes, I realized my phone was connected to the Bluetooth of my work car, which she was driving. (laughs) <laughs> sure enough when we stopped at the servo i could hear will's dulcet tones coming from the vehicle as he told charlie about we- about walking in on women up to mischief in a wash- on a washing machine and charlie asking whether he'd engage and said mischief if given the chance oh my god those first 50 episodes who are those young men who are those guys my boss looked through the window with utter disbelief at what she was hearing. A TED Talk. And she Just looked- a normal TED Talk. <laughs> a TED Talk about all female sex orgies on washing machines. And she looked at me. I was bright red. But she never mentioned anything no. about it. You know what? She's fucking hit you with the crazy. Yeah. And this is good. This levels mm-hmm. the playing field. You've just fucking gone. You think you're fucking, yeah. you're in the prison yard. That's right. That's what you got to do. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm about to go crazy. loco. <laughs> That's right. She never mentioned anything about it. So I kept the episode rolling. Mm-hmm. And the next time we swapped cars, I figured it was my duty to further my boss's contemporary cultural understandings with more 
Tofop. Perhaps she didn't even know Tofop was coming through the Bluetooth from my phone and just enjoyed the Batman conversations and hearing about the biggest horse in Norway all by herself. So I continued to play it every time we had to drive in convoy. Uh, one day Tofop dried up, so we began. <laughs> my dad wrote a porno. <laughs> Finally, that day, she asked me what the content of these TED Talks were actually all about. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, thank you for your content. Although it did little to improve my life of my now former boss, it did much to, and I've never heard this this word before, ameliorate what was otherwise a most traumatic experience, legends. Ah. So happy we could help you out, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. uh, Yeah, thank you. Thank you for writing in. I hope you're in a better work situation. Now, that is TOEFOP for this week. Um, Go to TOEFOP.com to check out other great podcasts. We've got a FOEFOP coming out this week. I don't know who it's with. I'm recording. I've got to reach out to someone in the next couple of days to do this FOEFOP. Unless you've got one. I don't, but hopefully by next week, I'll be able to take an episode off your plate. Uh, Fingers crossed. That'd be awesome. And then the final episode of uh, Footy Fixers with Scott Dooley uh, is up online at uh, really great stuff. It's a very stupid series. We did like 13 episodes. We didn't really know what we were doing when we started. I don't think we really figured it out by the end of it, but people seem to like it. I liked it. I I listened to it heaps. Oh, you listened to it? I reckon I think I've listened to most of the episodes and – um, yeah, I, I thought it was really fun, really funny. And uh, Two Guys, One Cup, our uh, AFL podcast, we should mention. You might have heard some promos, uh, but we have moved it exclusively over to the Listener app, uh, which is a free app. Yeah. So it's it's, um, But it just means that we have a little bit more support to do that podcast weekly. And also they've given us some money to do it, which is nice. And uh, um, so we will be back doing our uh, AFL foot, football podcast, Two Guys, One Cup. Uh, I believe the first episode might be on the regular feed. And then after that, uh, if you want to hear that, you have to go to the listener app. But again, it's a free app. Um, you know, you, yeah. you have to sign up to it, but it is a free app. So you will still be able to hear the show absolutely for free. Uh, and any other housekeeping to do? You've plugged your show. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I've got shows, heaps of shows. So um, some people have asked me, I just wanted to make this point because somebody asked me online, which was um, I've added some uh, Sydney shows the same weekend as my What You Talking About Will show. Um, the other shows are Will Logical. So I'm doing my what, right. what You Talking About Will show that I was meant to do last year on the Sunday night, but the Friday and the Saturday night at the end more are my new uh, show, uh, Will Logical. And I haven't done a new show in Sydney for a couple of years so uh, very excited about uh, having a whole weekend Friday, Saturday and Sunday at at the Enmore Theatre in Sydney that's coming up so get amongst it Awesome I'm Charlie Clawson I'm Will Anderson This podcast is a TOEFOP production. Head to TOEFOP.com for more. Cool things for cool people.